Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. By right of creation, God holds title deed to the world, every square inch of it. But because he allows free will and because humans are prone to follow Satan, planet Earth has become what C.S. Lewis described as enemy occupied territory. That, of course, implies a war between God and Satan. So here's a battle where one of the participants is powerful, but the other is all powerful or omnipotent, an infinite difference. It's not even a contest. God will defeat Satan when Satan is no longer useful. As Martin Luther said, one little word will fail him. The outcome of the war then is not in doubt. History remains his story. Every human choice is a variable in the equation. Yet, despite billions of such choices, every minute for thousands of years, all goes as he said it would. Again, C.S. Lewis gave a rich insight. He wrote, Free will is the modus operandi of destiny. God acts in human history whenever he chooses. And that's what happened with a man named Abram, whom God later renamed Abraham. God chose to make a covenant with this man. And that covenant contains a series of world-changing promises. And it is here at this covenant where so much of the battle of the ages still is being waged. Satan's main line of attack is the same as it was with Eve. Has God really said? Regarding the covenant, Satan might cunningly ask, did this covenant really take place? Was it legal? Is it binding? Did God mislead Abraham and his descendants? Were Abraham or his progeny able to negate the covenant? Did God literally mean what he said, or was it symbolic? To understand God's plan for the world it is vital to understand what at first may seem like a dry subject, covenants. But if you'll give me a moment to explain it, you'll be amazed at how much truth it will open up. In the Bible, God makes two kinds of covenants with human beings conditional and unconditional. A conditional covenant is predicated on God saying to man, if you will. An unconditional covenant is predicated on God saying to man, I will. Conditional covenants are like the contracts we humans make among ourselves. If you give me a certain amount of money, then I will give you a car. God makes conditional covenants too. He made one with Israel through Moses. In Exodus chapter 19, he said, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Did they obey his voice and keep his covenant? No. God offered them a deal, but they didn't fulfill their part of the bargain. Does God then have to fulfill his part? No. A conditional covenant means, if you do this, then I'll do that. But God also made unconditional covenants. In an unconditional covenant, God simply says, I will, period. Once such a covenant goes into effect, there are no conditions that have to be fulfilled by human beings. God's covenant with Abraham, what theologians call the Abrahamic covenant, is an unconditional covenant. Through the years, God reiterates it and expands it, but he never changes the unconditional nature of it. Indeed, he cannot change it or he would be a liar. And the Bible says in Titus chapter 1, verse 2 and elsewhere, God cannot lie. This covenant is one of the great dividing lines of Scripture. Disbelieving it won't change God's word, but it will change a person in profound ways. Among other things, 
he won't understand what's going on in the world because all goes back to the book of Genesis chapter 12 beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Some critics argue that this is a conditional covenant because it begins with God giving the command go forth from your country before the list of I wills beginning with I will make you a great nation. Dr. Dwight Pentecost, a Dallas Theological Seminary professor said, the fact of the covenant depended on obedience. The kind of covenant inaugurated was totally unrelated to the continuing obedience of either Abraham or his seed. In verse 1, God says to Abraham, go forth from your country. Then verse 4 says, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. So even if you consider the opening command a condition, Abraham met that condition. He left his country, and God then fully institutes the covenant. To add other conditions later would be like moving the goalposts just as the football team is about to score. It wouldn't be honest. God is not tricky. He's trustworthy. Once the covenant went into effect, nothing could change it. Later, God would reiterate the covenant and expand on it, but he never changed the nature of it, nor did he add conditions to it. Those who claim he did have a fundamental problem. They're saying that God lied. Psalm 105 says, He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, and then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you will I give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. This verse calls it a covenant forever and an everlasting covenant. If it depended on frail human beings, the word of God would not call it everlasting. Because somewhere along the line, human beings fail, as Israel proved again and again. Sometimes people are confused because later on, God gives Abraham many instructions, and they think maybe that's part of the covenant. But it should be no surprise that God continued to work with Abraham. After all, he continues to work with each of us, bringing us into conformity with his will and his person. But the covenant was not dependent on those things because it was already in effect. And from that moment on, it went into effect. It was up to God to fulfill it, not Abraham, not Israel, not you, and not me. Because this is an unconditional covenant. It cannot end. It remains in effect today and forever. That makes it fundamental to Bible prophecy. Whatever else happens, you can bet the form that God will keep his covenant with Abraham. So if you want to look into the future or have a better understanding of the present, look at the things God promised Abraham. He expressed them in a series of direct and implied I will statements. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make you a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Through you, I will bless all the families of the earth. Thank you so much for standing with me as a watchman on the wall. I pray daily that he will reward your faithfulness and protect and prosper you in these difficult times. Thank you again for being a vital part of my team. 
To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit HalLindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE. You might notice something missing from that list. What about the land? Does God ever actually give the land of Judea to Abraham and his seed? Yes, in Genesis chapter 13. God expands on the original covenant, adding a title deed to the whole Holy Land, not just Judea. After Abraham and his nephew Lot went their separate ways, Lot toward Sodom and Abraham staying in Canaan, our present-day Israel. The Lord said to Abraham, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. Those words are straightforward and unambiguous. They leave no doubt. But two chapters later, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, introduces one of the most important doctrines of the Bible. Salvation by faith alone. It says, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Abraham is still technically called Abram at this point, because God doesn't change his name until he receives the rite of circumcision years later. This is crucial because it shows for sure it was not circumcision which made Abraham righteous. It was faith alone, faith without circumcision. As it says in the New Living Translation, Abram believed the Lord and the Lord declared him righteous because of his faith. In the next verse, verse 7, God reiterates that he has given Abraham this land and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. You know, one reason I love the Bible is that it tells the truth about its heroes. And they turn out to be a lot like you and me. In verse 6, Abraham believed in the Lord. In verse 7, God reiterates the fantastic truth that the land is his. Then in verse 8, just two down from the great faith verse, Abraham's faith needs bolstering. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? God certainly could have replied, because I said so. And that should have been enough. But in his mercy to Abraham and all who through the ages would hear this story, he gives an illustrated sermon like none before or since. He used the most certain and absolute way of making a covenant of that region and era. God graciously condescended to Abraham's understanding of this familiar solemn ritual in order to reinforce the absolute certainty of this unconditional covenant he is making with him. At God's instruction, Abraham brought a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Except for the two birds, he cut each carcass in half and laid the halves opposite one another. Abraham knew that in this ceremony, the parties making the covenant would walk between the halved animals, symbolically saying, may this happen to me if I do not fulfill my part of this covenant. Abraham cut them in two, laid them out and waited. He waited through the heat of the day. The birds would swoop in and try to eat the dead animals, but Abraham kept watch and shooed them away. Verse 12 says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. At this point, God speaks to him about the captivity in Egypt his descendants would one day endure. Though Abraham's already old, God tells him that he has many more years ahead and that he will die in peace. Then God says that after Abraham's descendants leave their captivity, they will return to this land, to Canaan, what we now call Israel. 
After that came one of the strangest sights in the history of the world. Verse 17 says, It came about when the sun had set, that was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So God waited until dark so that Abraham could get the full visual impact. He put him to sleep so that he couldn't interfere with the ceremony, then woke him in time to see this astounding sight, a smoking oven and a flaming torch, both symbols of God's presence passing between the halved animals. Abraham had expected to pass down that walkway with God, but God was telling Abraham and every person who would ever hear this story that the fulfillment of this solemn covenant would not be up to Abraham or his descendants. God walked alone because God alone takes absolute responsibility for his fulfillment. Notice that the specific promises he illustrates here is the land deed. God said to your descendants, I have past tense. It's a done deal. I have given this land. If God took the land back and gave it to someone else, it would make him a liar. The Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants, I have given this land. These words carry the force of eternal law. They will never change because God will never change. His character will not change. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the only people on earth that have a title deed to a specific property on this planet from its owner, God himself. It's as simple as this. Either God was telling Abraham the truth or he's a liar. You can't have it both ways. But there are people who try. They say the covenant is still in effect, but not with the physical offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They say God rejected Israel and has transferred these promises to the church. This is something called replacement theology, pure heresy. Now the Bible does sometimes use allegories, but when it does, it makes it very obvious. When you interpret the Bible as allegorical, as a matter of theological convenience, you go from a house built on a rock to a house built on sand. In John 8, verse 58, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He meant that Abraham looked forward to the fulfillment of, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus fulfilled that scripture by becoming the savior of the world. He got his blood right as the son of David through Mary and his legal right through his stepfather, Joseph. Therefore, Jesus fulfilled to the letter what the prophecies required for him to be the descendant of both Abraham and David's right to his throne. The Bible emphasizes a distinct physical lineage that is literal. If Jesus were not their descendant, would anyone take seriously the idea that he could be the Messiah? Of course not. The Messiah had to be many things, including a Jew. In my book, The Promise, I examined how Jesus perfectly fulfilled Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah. One of the great miracles of history is the fact that Jesus so perfectly fulfilled the requirements of being Messiah, not in some allegorical, spiritualized manner, but literally. Jesus was literally born from the tribe of Judah, literally from the family of David, literally from a virgin in David's bloodline, and literally born in Bethlehem, literally a descendant of both Abraham and David, literally sold out for 30 pieces of silver, literally pierced in his literal hands and feet, 
literally hung on a cross, literally surrounded by Gentiles at his execution. His executioners literally cast lots for his clothes, and he was literally buried like a criminal, but in a rich man's grave. Those are only a few that could be spoken. If you spiritualize, though, the fulfillment of those prophecies, who in his right mind would still believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Only because he literally fulfilled those and dozens of other Messianic prophecies can we be absolutely certain of his identity. If Abraham had heard the argument that God had switched from literal descendants to spiritual ones, he would have felt cheated. Chapter 15 begins with him complaining to God that he had no son and that as of the moment, Eliezer of Damascus was his heir. He didn't want his heir to be heir because of legal rules. He wanted a son. And God then assured him that he would have a son, a real live flesh of his flesh, literal son, the child of promise. Replacement theology depicts God as then an unscrupulous salesman using bait and switch tactics. Some argue that Israel sinned again and again, eventually even rejecting Jesus. How do I answer that? I don't need to. The Bible already did. Romans chapter 3, verse 3, speaking specifically of the Jews, says, What if some did not believe? Their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Will it? Of course not. Verse 4 says, May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. The Bible is clearly saying here that the unfaithfulness of Israelites does not negate the faithfulness of God. If you can spiritualize God's covenant with Abraham, you can push whatever part of Scripture you don't like into the realm of the allegory. Do that, and eventually you will subjugate the Bible itself to the realm of myth. Sadly, for millions, that's exactly what has happened. The best rule of interpretation is this. If the literal sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. The Reformation broke forth when Christian theologians again started to take the obvious literal meaning of Scripture seriously. Beginning with that act of faith, God began restoring great truths from His Word to His church, beginning with salvation by faith alone. When they began applying the same principle to prophecy, they discovered that God was not yet through with Israel. He couldn't be because his covenant with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. It remains in effect and always will. As I've said before, interpreting passages allegorically allows the interpreter to tell the Bible what it means instead of the Bible telling the interpreter what it means. If you spiritualize what the Bible speaks literally, then you pass through the looking glass into a murky world where nothing is solid and nothing can be counted on. Some say the real return of Israel to its homeland won't happen until after the Jews have repented and accepted Jesus. That's why they think the present gathering in Israel is fraudulent. But they have the order reversed. Through the prophet Ezekiel, God said, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name when I take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. He brings them back to Canaan, not because they deserve it, but for the integrity of his name alone. Then after they are back, he starts to clean them up. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. The sequence here is unmistakable. First, he gathers them back to Canaan while they're still in their filthiness. It's only after that that he cleanses them and pours out his spirit on them. We're seeing the return now. We can expect that he will soon cleanse his people. The covenant 
is reaffirmed as eternal and unconditional many times in the Old Testament. So what does the New Testament say? Romans chapter 11 verse 1 succinctly asks and answers the most pertinent point. Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. That's just one of many New Testament passages refuting replacement theology and affirming that God's covenant with Abraham is still in effect. Not only does this covenant help us understand what's happening in the Middle East right now, it is foundational to the central meaning of all the Bible's teaching. From the identity and purpose of Jesus to salvation by faith alone, to Christ coming to set up a literal thousand-year kingdom on earth, to Christ secretly snatching up all believers to heaven before the great tribulation begins. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. God bless you. And God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.